Hi, everyone. If you've uh, been in this room before, welcome back. If you're new, this is the Mastering App Dynamics track where we help practitioners learn how to use App Dynamics to become even more powerful. And uh, this is the Dashboard Rockstar session. It's a Dashboard Rockstar, not Rockstar, unfortunately. Um, and we have a great speaker for you. His name is Andy Jackson, um, also known as the wreck -It Ralph of APM. And uh, without further ado, please welcome Andy Jackson. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Still got more people coming in. That's great. I was hoping for standing room only, but we're not quite there. So I want to take you through dashboards and um, kind of how we start creating some dashboards. So there's a few different bits and pieces we'll go through. The first thing I'm going to do is introduce you to this guy. Now, for me, this guy, uh, when I first joined App Dynamics, was a guy called Matthew Mulqueen, who uh, was one of the FSRs then. I don't know how many of you have met Matt. Um, but this guy might be your boss, it might be a colleague, or it might be you. And then I'm going to introduce you to this guy. This handsome devil is me. I've got huge hands, so apparently I look a lot like Wreck-It Ralph. And uh, there was a conversation we had in my first, probably first couple of months at this company. And it went along the lines of, hey, we've got App Dynamics deployed. Now what we want is for you to go in and make a dashboard. And I say, a dashboard? Hmm. So I go back to Matt and I asked him, you know, what do you want? And he said, well, the way you get value out of App Dynamics is you start by installing a controller or provisioning a SaaS controller. Then you install some agents. Then you do some BT naming rules. You create a dashboard and boom, now you've got value. It's a key step in creating value with App Dynamics. You cannot create value without dashboard. So I do what every good SE would do and I say, a dashboard. Hmm, okay. And I Google for a dashboard. <laughs> and this is what I see. And I think, great. Now I know what I need. So I take you one step further and I look and I think, right, this is a great dashboard. It's got everything I need to know. And then you start to look at this dashboard and you think, green stuff I get. Green's good. Yellow, I guess that's OK. But what does brown mean? What are all these numbers and are they all useful to me? I mean, this dashboard's about traveling around London and it's about you know, people who are taking a tube as well as driving. I'm only ever doing one of those at one point, so is it all relevant or is there something missing? The other definition of a dashboard is a piece of wood that keeps the mud out of a car back in the old days. And if you end up with a dashboard like this, you may as well just put a piece of wood up on the wall because it's not actually telling anyone anything that's useful at all. So I go back to my, uh, my friend, the sales guy, and um, he says, well, I just want something that shows me if there's a problem with the application. And I say, right, I've got it. And I show him all of the out-of-the-box dashboards that come with App Dynamics, right? One thing we're really good at doing is showing you, is there anything wrong with our application? So why do you want a dashboard at that point? Um, next, he comes back and he's like, no, I want something that looks absolutely awesome. And I'm like, great, I know exactly what you want. And I go away and I create something that looks a little bit like this which some of the people in this room may have seen. We created this for a few customers. Um, only when we created it, we used Marvel characters, but Legal said I wasn't allowed to use Marvel characters, so these are the public domain superheroes. I don't know if you've ever met these guys before, but they are Lash Lightning and uh, Mr. Raven, the Unknown Soldier, and my favorite, the Green Llama. And uh, what's cool is their eyes go red if there's a problem with the application. And it's like, yeah, great, I've got something cool. And I go back to my sales guy, and he's like, yeah, I want something like that, but for all the important business transactions. Well, unfortunately, I looked, and there are not enough public domain superhero dashboards, uh, pictures to make a dashboard. But we've got this list. 
This list is in AppDynamics, and if you sort it by health, you get a list with all the problems at the top. Why would you want a dashboard that has Lash Lightning's eyes going red? It's just to make it pretty, or is it actually usable? So at this point, I've completely confused Matt, or my sales guy, or whoever that guy is who's asking you for a dashboard, and I just say, at the end of the day, wouldn't you rather we just told you there was a problem with the application, so you didn't have to look at a dashboard and know you had to go fix something? And I think that's a valid point. So what are we going to talk about for the next roughly 30 minutes? Uh, we're going to talk about dashboards. We're going to talk about things that I've seen that are pitfalls and things that I think we've got to avoid doing. And that's you know, AppDynamics technical guys as well as probably customers. We're going to talk about what my process was that I, I learned through creating some of the, uh, the dashboards that we've seen at, at Carphone Warehouse and some of the other customers. And we're going to talk about how I do it. So quite a few people have been over to the dashboard booth today and asked me how we create some of these bits and pieces. And I'm going to show you how to do those so you can create dashboards that look cool, if nothing else. So basically, this whole section is about me and what I want to do. And that's really important because you, know, you can take pieces away from this, but you are going to have to make this you know, your own process and, and do it yourself or get professional services in to come do it for you. We can do that as well. So first of all, this is a dashboard we've created for many customers. And I really like it. I really like the fact that we've got the key journeys of everything that our customers do. Um, has everyone, anyone got a dashboard like this? Something similar? Less people than I expected. Does anyone think this is a useful dashboard? Less people than I expected. <laughs> is anyone awake? <laughs> Great. We can see all the key steps for every, every journey as well. Right? And this is a dashboard that we've created as, as a pre-sales organization for a lot of customers, which is why I'm surprised a lot of people haven't seen something similar to this. The things I don't like about this dashboard are if that goes red, why is that gone red? It's telling me there's something wrong, but I don't know what it is. I've got to go and look into it. I've got to go find the problem. The other piece is this one's yellow, and it's got a number there, and I've no idea what that number is. And one of the key pitfalls you find is if you make a dashboard, you know what that number is. It's the number of milliseconds it takes for the page to load in an end user's browser on average in that time frame. Well, that's great, but no one else knows that. And they might think it's the business transaction response time or the 95th percentile or any other number, any other metric that we have. So without putting a label on it, it makes it pretty useless as a dashboard other than for you as a single person. So you put it up on the wall, and it just generates questions. Why is that red? And all of a sudden, you've got this tool that was supposed to make your life easier. And actually, it's making your life a lot harder because you've got people stopping by and saying, hey, I've noticed your dashboard's yellow. Why? The next one is putting graphs on dashboards. This is a real pet peeve of mine because I was visiting a customer um, over Black Friday, and they had App Dynamics on about five out of six screens. And the sixth screen was a black screen with green bars going across. And first of all, I had to ask what it was, because it wasn't clear. I didn't know. And they told me it was revenue. I was like, great, that's a useful graph on you know, the, your busiest peak day of the year. It's great to have revenue. Only, is that good or is it bad? Without having some point of reference on a graph, they become useless again. Luckily, AppDynamics has the, the great answer to that of, well, let's plot the baseline. So I'm going to show you how to do that as well. So what went wrong on these dashboards? Um, these were dashboards that looked pretty, but were functionally useless, like the Lamborghini Countach. If anyone knows this, it was probably the iconic car of its time, only if you took it out of the garage, it would break, and you'd have to spend thousands getting it repaired again. Um, looking at how much information do you actually want to put on here, if it's something that looks like this, it sounds like a report to me, is it something you actually want to put on a dashboard and view on the wall? If it's something that looks like this, it's probably closer to a dashboard. And the final one, which uh, I've seen a few times, is 
people put these up on the wall and they have five or six dashboards that cycle around and App Dynamics takes three seconds to load and then you make it flick off after five seconds. So no one can actually even read what's going on on the dashboard anyway. And you may as well have just made yourself a nice, pretty chocolate teapot because it's absolutely useless. So what's my process for generating dashboards? Number one is, is planning this. So you can't just go out and create a dashboard in App Dynamics. If you do, you're going to drag and drop widgets on, you're going to make them different colors, and it's not going to be a, a useful dashboard. The first thing I do is think about who's the actual audience for this? Who am I making this for? And I go and ask them questions like, why do you want a dashboard? And to be honest, I argue that you don't want a dashboard until you can prove to me that you do want a dashboard. Because I think most people want to get an SMS text message when there's a problem and then drill into why they've got a problem or get an email or a support ticket raised. Only if you can't do it that way and get that push notification is do you actually want a dashboard unless you just want something pretty to go on the wall. What's the outcome you want from this dashboard? Is it something which people are going to use to you know, actually dive into the problem? Or is it just to keep you know, some of the senior managers happy that you're definitely looking at something? And how are people actually going to use this dashboard? Is it going to be up on the wall? Are people going to be able to use it interactively? Or is it literally just you know, something pretty on the wall that tells you some information? You need to know the answers to all these questions, because if you don't, you're, not, you're going to have a bit of an identity crisis when you've got a dashboard. You know, if you've got something on the wall that you have to double click on and you've got no mouse to double click, it makes it pointless. So that said, um, when you're talking to your audience, I like to show things that we've made elsewhere. Um, what can we do with that dynamics? What are the types of things we've made for other people in the, in the business? Just to make sure that you know, they understand the type of thing that we're, we're looking to build. And then I take a paper and pen, and I actually draw out what, do, what does the dashboard need to have on it? What are the components? And kind of agree that criteria up front with my customer, with the person I'm making this dashboard for. If it's me making this dashboard for myself, I know what I want to see, and I want to know that if that spinner shows some red, I want to be able to double click, and then if I double click, I want to go to this dashboard, and I map it out before I even start creating this. So if we start drawing it and understanding you know, why, uh, why are we doing this, what's the point on it, then we get to this point where we'll understand what are they trying to do with the dashboard. And they're trying to make something that's uh, allowing them to drill into a problem, get all the way to resolution, or are we just showing some business metrics to keep everybody happy? Once we understand all of that, we can then start to make a good dashboard. So the first rule is P, 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 P. Does anyone remember that from school? No? It's proper planning and preparation prevents piss poor performance dashboards. So that's the first one to take away. The second piece is actually building it. And we'll talk a little bit about this next. Um, actually creating dashboards, you know, we can create some really cool, powerful dashboards in AppDynamics. I'm going to show you a few tips and tricks on that. But building it is building it. It's, it's just applying some time and, and making it look like what you want to look like. And you've already got the design from, from step one. Step three is then to review it with the customer. And you need to sit down and say, look, this is what I've built you. This is how we're going to achieve those goals that we talked about in step one when we were planning this. It might not look exactly like the piece of paper. You know, they might draw widgets that we just don't have in App Dynamics. Well, that's fine, as long as we can achieve that same goal in another way. And you've got to kind of sell it back to them and say, look, can I achieve all your goals? Are you happy with that? And step four is this is a constant improvement, continuous improvement. You've got to keep working on dashboards. I think one of the key things that makes me feel like the dashboards that I've made in some customers has been good is that actually they've changed over time. So the original dashboard was used so much that people went, I like that, but can we add this bit on? Or can we change that so it does this instead? If nobody's asking for updates, 
I feel like nobody's using the dashboard. So actually, you need to be prepared to make some changes and, and do things different ways and maybe create copies of it for different people and make it more specific to them as well. So the four stages that I've mentioned kind of fit into the plan, do, check, act cycle, as you'd expect. As I have had zero audience participation so far, I'm going to pre-warn you now, we're going to play a game. And it's called Good Dash, which makes a happy guy, or bored. So very simple game. I'm going to show you a dashboard. And then I'm going to ask everyone to cheer if you like it. And then I'm going to ask you to boo if you think it's rubbish. So first dashboard is this one. Wow, that was quick. Any cheers? No. Fair enough. It's pretty terrible, right? It's an easy one to start with. Um, I have no idea what that graph's showing me. It's got too much stuff on it. Uh, we've got actually two metrics here, which are so far apart on the scale, they just look like flat lines, which is pointless. And uh, someone's deleted a business transaction here, and it's just disappeared. That's a great sign that no one's using the dashboard. OK, next one. Take your time. Have a think about it. Who likes it? And who thinks it's rubbish? I think there's only three people playing this game. <laughs> All those who haven't decided. Who likes it? Yeah. I made this one. Who likes it? Yeah. And who thinks it's rubbish? <laughs> Great. Um, I think this dashboard's really good. <laughs> However, it could be improved. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll remain coachable on this. It can be improved. Um, one of the things it does really well, so you, know, you can't really say whether this is a good dashboard or bad dashboard without understanding who the audience was. Now, this was built for one of our customers on Black Friday when you know, they were wanting to know how many iPhones are they selling and where in that process are people dropping off. They want to make sure that basically their app is in hypercare. They want to be staring at these dashboards for 24 hours and make sure that nothing's going wrong. So actually, now that I tell you that, does this seem like a better dashboard for that purpose? Hooray! <laughs> so we've got all the different um, key, key components of selling an iPhone for this customer. On this graph, we've got two different axes, and, and one of them is the average, and one of them is the 95th percentile, because the 95th percentile will always trend quicker than the average. So if you want to know things very, very quickly, the 95th percentile becomes very useful. Again, that's what the customer was asking for. That's what they told me they wanted, and I drew it before we made this. We know that on, on launch days and on, on Black Fridays for this customer, we know that the, the thing that's going to bring them down is load. So we want to see the full application load at a quick glance. Are we hitting nearly the point where our application is going to break? And we want to keep an eye on how many transactions are actually running slow and very slow. So personally, I think this was a great dashboard, despite what you all think. <laughs> Let's move on to the next one. Yeah. So. Who thinks it's a good dashboard? Hands up. And who thinks it's rubbish? No? <laughs> One or two? So the first thing to notice about this dashboard is actually it's got business metrics on it. You cannot see business metrics anywhere else. So there's a definite need for this dashboard. And no one wants this sent out via an email, and no one wants text messages of this stuff. So. You know, it's the first one that's convinced me that you don't need just a report or a, an email alert. This actually requires a dashboard. It's got clear labels on absolutely everything on here, and I really like that because it means that you guys sitting there now and you've never seen this dashboard before, but you can tell the, the state of this business. Our App Dynamics T-shirt shop should have made it App APDY. Could have carried on with the branding from this morning. It's got a graph on here, but that graph is made useful by the fact that there is a baseline. If there wasn't a baseline, I wouldn't know whether the, that was good or bad. But because there's a baseline, I can tell it's normal. 
And everybody loves a good donut graph. I think this was just thrown in for good measure. This one down here is the, the, the good or bad piece. And it, it all comes down to what the use case is for the dashboard. This is actually showing you five or six key pages. And as a stacked bar chart, if any one of those grows dra dramatically, we can tell there's a problem with that page. So it's an interesting way of trying to show information. I wonder if it was drawn that way or whether it was just made that way. And the last piece I really like is putting events on dashboards. This is really useful, right? So if we can see a drop off in traffic, is there an event that's triggering it? And that stops people from coming up to you and asking you what's going on because there's an event there. All right, final one. So hands up for good, good dashboard. And hands up for rubbish dashboard. About 50-50. <laughs> so again, this is kind of cool in that it shows you what are the user journeys and what are the key components and what are the shared key components of that journey. The bits I don't like about it are the fact that there's numbers on there that don't tell you what they are. Again, I don't know what this dashboard's telling me. And there's green lights on there, and I don't know what a red light means. Is it that there's too many errors, or is it that the response time has gone too high or too low? So these are all the kind of things that I've seen a lot of that I think, you know, in a dashboard that's going to go up on the wall or be shared with other people, we need to make sure we don't do. So I've shown you a bunch of dashboards, and the first question is, how are we going to start making these? So you might go, hey, Andy, my controller doesn't have those cool-looking widgets. How do we make things like the, uh, the ring indicator, the small, tiny icon here, and, and lash lightning? I definitely don't have a lash lightning widget. So I don't know how many of you know this, but these are all just normal images over the top of the standard health rule widget. All we do is create an image with a transparent zone and put that over the top of an existing uh, health rule indicator. Did people know that? Have people done that before? So some people have, some people haven't. And it's, it's quite a neat trick. It's the only way you're going to start to make cool looking dashboards in my mind, because you know, really cool dashboards don't just have circles on them. And if you take it to the extreme, you can make things like this, which are really cool. I like this. And again, it's the same principle. There's just a green health indicator behind the back. But this one, we've even created things like drop shadows to make it look cool. And you know, it goes up on the wall, and it gets noticed. So how do we go about creating some of these pieces? Um, I take, take an image, and I actually design it in GIMP. I don't know who's used GIMP. You can use Photoshop or whatever your favorite image manipulation tool is. Once you've created that, take a copy of the image and upload it to a base64 encoder. What that's going to do is take the image and translate it into text. Um, so you drop your image in here, and you click Copy Image. The reason we're doing this is because there is no way to upload an image and store it on your controller, especially if you're in SAS. And the last thing you want to do is be hosting images somewhere else and having to drag them across and, and have all that pain. So by doing this, we get this whole chunk of text, which looks a little bit like this, actually 20 times longer than that for this particular image. It is not pleasant, particularly. And uh, you have to be a little bit careful if you put that text into something like Notepad, it will crash Notepad. But if you take that and put it straight into an image widget, then it just works. And it's resizable, and it you know, looks pretty good. So that's my second tip there is you know, create these images with transparent zones or with you know, slightly opaque zones, then upload it to Base64 image encoder, and put that into your image widget. And that's how you get something that looks pretty cool like this. Now, this piece over here is the next piece, which I think should be, personally, I'm on a little crusade. I think it should be on pretty much every dashboard. And this is the events widget. Has everyone put events widgets on your dashboards? Yeah, a few. Who's going to put events widgets on your dashboard after this session? 
I'm hoping pretty much everyone. So I think these are cool because what happens is you've got Lash lightning up on your screen and his eyes go red. And as I've said, everybody starts asking you questions. You know, why is Lash lightning's eyes red? What's wrong? If you have one of these up on the wall, I can see it's red because of one of those particular two problems. Again, it just gives that level of confidence that the dashboard is showing you exactly what the problems are in your estate at that particular moment. Now, what you need to make sure you do is not just put all your events in there, otherwise you'll have events and loads of green circles. And the way you do that is by selecting the particular business transactions that are powering the health rule indicators on that dashboard that you're creating. So you want to match the two up. The other pieces that I said I really liked are having events on graphs. So if you are just going to have a graph on the wall and you don't want to put an events widget in there, the other piece you can do is add events into your graph. And it's pretty easy to do. I don't, again, you've got to just click around in here and you'll find all these options. But if you go into the advanced, uh, into the um, widget settings, you'll see you can just tick the box for displaying events. Again, you get the option then to go in and select which business transactions are applicable to that events list. So matching the events that appear on the graph to whatever you're displaying on the graph is important. And again, my final piece is looking at the baselines and how do we map the baseline onto what we've created. This is pretty quick and easy again. So you've created a graph widget already. You double click on your metric. This one is the uh, home page average response time. And if you scroll down under advanced, there's a tick box for adding a baseline. You can select which baseline you want to compare against. So depending on which dashboard you're making, you might want to use one of the specific ones. If we take the default baseline, we'll get you know, on a, the 30-day average baseline. All of a sudden, I'm looking at that, that spike and thinking, well, that is a spike, and it's a spike of four over my normal of five, which before I only knew it was you know, nine. I didn't know what that meant. <coughs> By adding that piece in, we now know you know, the relevance of spikes on graphs. Another thing we do a lot of, and I think it confuses people a little bit, is, is adding in drill downs onto these pieces. So if this goes red and you want to create a drill down, so this is more of a dashboard that you're going to use on your laptop. So one of the ways we do that is I don't just want the link to be on the, the text, I want the link to be on the entire circle. So I'll often create a label, and I'll put it over the top of the entire dashboard. I'll typically wait until I've finished building the dashboard, and I'll do it last, and I'll put a, a text label over the top, delete the text so there's nothing in the box, then make it transparent, and at this point you lose it on the graph, and uh, it can be a little bit of fun trying to find it again, but just remember where you've put them, and then add a drill down link in there as well. So now I've got this ability to go anywhere inside this circle and click to drill down to you know, the, the front page. But as soon as I come out of there, I've got no drill downs again. So the last portion is what's new in 4.3. So some customers have been upgraded to 4.3. Some of them are on the way to being upgraded. If you're on premise, hopefully you can upgrade as well. Uh, but there's a few new features that are coming out that are going to make this whole dashboard design process even easier. And the first one is, if you've created a dashboard, you've probably created something that looks like this, where you drop a load of uh, health widgets in, and the first thing you notice is, well, they look ugly. I want to align them all, and you spend ages moving them all, and then you move them back. We've now got this ability to shift and drag and select multiple options, and literally just do a right click and align to left, align to top, so we can create grid patterns even in the absolute layout. For me, this is going to save me a lot of time. Instant pretty. The other piece in there which you might have seen is order. Now, order has changed slightly. In the previous versions, you've had send to back or send to front. And we've now got the ability to nudge one back piece by piece and forwards one by one. Again, that's going to make my life a lot easier. I can bring something one step forward, make a change to it, and put it one step back again. 
small change, but going to make this process a whole lot easier. Delete has always been in there. Um, however, we've probably all been in the situation where you've accidentally hit delete and uh, everything just disappeared and you feel like you're left out in the rain and there's, there's nothing you can do and you've just deleted all your hard work and you just feel like crying. You can look at that video all day. However, we've now got the ability to do a control Z and Apple Z if you're on an Apple machine and all of a sudden everything pops back up and everything's good. So really great new features. Um, I think there's a lot more to come in dashboards, but right now, that's where we're at. So recap, first of all, understand your audience. What are people trying to achieve? Understand why they want a dashboard. Try your hardest to persuade them not to bother with the dashboard. If you can't persuade them not to bother, there's probably a good reason why they want a dashboard. Keep it as an iterative process. You know, if you're making a dashboard for someone, maybe make it with them. If you're making it yourself, keep making changes to it, keep making improvements to it. Use the tools that I've just given you, so Base64 transparency um, with labels over the top of things for drill downs. And to be honest, just get out there and start playing with it. Um, if you've got any questions, please feel free to shout up. When they create their health wall, that's going to appear as a as a an event in the actual uh, transaction scorecard area of of your overall uh, when you've got your your map view of your application. So how do you go away to let people create loads and loads of different health walls without ending up in a situation where you've got 33 critical events in your scorecard going on when they're not really if for the person that's looking at the overall sort of uh, an overall dashboard looking at the whole system. They're going to say, oh, Christ, 33 critical events. But they're really critical events to that particular work stream that's got a dashboard around it, and they've created a, a critical alert base because they want, to, they want to be able to dashboard it. So how, how do you manage to satisfy those two sort of contradictory requirements? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so how do we create health rules that are not going to affect the, 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 the main dashboards? Main business scorecard. It's, it's yeah. like you want some... Sort of, sort of lower level, they're critical for that dashboard because that's the basis of the dashboard. But in terms of the guys sitting looking at the system as a whole, mm. you don't really want to bombard them with critical events all the time because it, it, they just start losing interest in clicking on them. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, as of right now, I probably don't have the greatest answer for that. Um, what I do, one of the things I do do to help is naming rules within alerts. So I will make sure that every alert, that I, every health rule that I create starts with the word dashboard. So we can see that, okay, that's just a dashboard health rule indicator. They will still appear, you're right, on the, the transaction scorecard. Um, Perhaps that's something you could add in as later on as a feature saying yeah. that this is a, a dashboard type critical alert rather than a scorecard and then you could, you could sort of tune it a bit better. Yeah, I'll definitely take that away and, and make that recommendation. I think that's a good, good, good idea. While I've got the microphone, that, that idea of the, uh, the event, that's really good. Uh, we, we basically paint that, that's on every dashboard we create now. You have your alert and you have the alert, the event because that tells you why the alert fired. And you can also, in, we normally put it in two different, we put it in the list view and the time view, so you've got both views. Because it means you can double click that and see the actual transactions that fired the alert. Yeah, that's and that's point. really good for you, you're basically double clicking down, you're, you're a couple of clicks away from looking at the actual transaction that caused the critical alert to fire, which is why the thing's gone red in the first place. So yeah, that's a good point. So if you have that, that health rule timeline or if you put the events onto the graph, if you double click on that event, it pops up with the, the same event pop up that you get if you get an email or if you get a, a Slack notification or however you're consuming your, your alerts. From that point, you can click the button that says view yeah. dashboard in time period and it'll take you to that pro to that business transaction at that specific point and again you know as, as you said we find it's really a really good funnel it's for un, un, you know un, people that don't really understand the system but are looking for the alerts that's just a keep clicking until you get to the transaction speak to the guy that owns that transaction absolutely yeah great point thanks for that
Any more questions over here? Andrew, uh, is it possible to inject real-world events by the API so that you can correlate those to the events that we see in here? Absolutely, yeah, you can. So there are APIs for adding events. So you can actually make application code change events uh, directly in, into the system. Again, if you use Google and uh, type in App Dynamics uh, Events API, you'll get our documentation page on exactly how to do that. And then again, that becomes part of the, the filters that we've talked about. So you can filter and say, I actually only want to see these custom alerts that we've put in. The second way you can do that using Business IQ is to actually add those alerts in as events within the, our events um, system. So there's two ways of doing it. One is as a, an application code change. One is as an event into the analytics kind of big data store. Make sense? Andy, could you talk a bit about dashboard permissions and particularly how you enable users to be able to create dashboards so other users can see but perhaps not edit or things like that? Yeah, so one of the strongest things with App Dynamics is our role-based access control. There's a lot of granularity in there. Um, each dashboard can, you know, by default, if you create a dashboard, it will be seen by all users. Now, you can get to the point where you have hundreds of dashboards, maybe too many dashboards. At that point, you'll want to start using role-based access control to filter it so you know, this team only sees the five that are relevant for their application or this team sees the five that are relevant for theirs. Um, you can go in and create a role, an example of core banking dashboard viewer, and say that this guy can see these particular dashboards for the core banking dashboards. You could then go back into the overall, you know, view for dashboards and say, well, not everyone can see them, and only assign that role to the relevant people. So you can actually get really granular in who's going to see which dashboards. Um, the other piece to that is you can share the dashboard. And what sharing a dashboard does is allows you to take that link and put it up on screens that are on the wall. And if it's a shared dashboard URL, you kind of lose a lot of the app dynamics uh, branding at the top. So you've got just a big dashboard, but also you can take that, you can put it on the screen, and users won't have permissions to drill down further as well. So creating users to, to make sure that screens on the wall are only screens on the wall for that particular dashboard and not having access to your entire uh, APM uh, information is, is quite useful as well. Did that answer your question? I feel like I went a little bit round and about. Got there in the end. Any more questions? Hello, hi. Yeah, uh, so we use quite a bit of uh, dashboard embedding. So we have applications that monitor the front end, uh, and we use App Dynamics to monitor the back end. And what we've seen is the uh, same as you said earlier on, where you can share a dashboard and you can put it on the wall. Yep. Similarly, other applications allow you to do the same capability. And what we want, or uh, what we generally try to do, is to embed that dashboard link from another application, like Eternity is one of our front end user application, yep. onto App Dynamics. But we see issues in it where maybe it's something to do with iframes. It's not doesn't support iframe the app dynamics dashboards. So is that going to be fixed in the next one? So you're trying to put app app dynamics dashboards into no, no. another no, no, the, uh, using app dynamics dashboard, bring in a, a link from external application, like a shared dashboard for another application, like Eternity, for example. Okay, so you want to you want to put an Eternity dashboard within the app dynamics yeah, dashboard. Yeah, yeah. So to give you a front end view and then the back end view. So each time we get a whole end-to-end -end view of the application. OK. Um, I think we'll take that offline, because it should. There's, a, there's an iframe widget, yeah. and you should be able to put the link in there to that really shared dashboard. Yeah. And you know, I, I'll, we'll take a look at okay, the specific yeah, use case, I think, afterwards. Okay. Yep. Hi. So going up a level, uh, we've got a dashboard that has a list, a group, uh, sorry, a list of various applications on it where we want to show red, green, uh, depending on whether that application has any failing health rules at all. So I heard a rumor there might be some functionality in 4.3 that allows that. Are you aware of that? Is that true or is that just 
something I might have misheard. So there's, first of all, you know, you could create a health rule for each application and put them all on the same dashboard but, but, currently. But then you have to, then you have to list all the potential health rules so it's not a dynamic list. You add a new health rule, you've got to go back and change your dashboard, blah, blah, blah. There is a combined widget. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure on the use case here. So you want to get a list. You want, of so you've got you you have ten applications that you've got AppDynamics on, and you want a, a dashboard that says, are, "Are are all your applications healthy or not?" Yep. So is it, I ideally want ten green blobs. Yep. But if any of your health rule for application A fail or trigger, ah, okay. you want that to go amber or red or whatever. So I think the way we would probably do that with the combined widget is to have one combined widget for every application. So the combined widget basically will say, these are all the business transactions in my application. There might be 10, there might be 100. And we'll list them all by whether they're, they're deviating on health or not. So you could have one of those for each application that will show you the health rule or the, the business transactions that are deviating at the top of that list. I think that's probably the best way of achieving that. Again, happy to discuss it later on over a, a beer if you want to come find me and uh, we can we can try and make some of that thanks thanks any more yeah. yep. uh, what what are the options that we have in terms of putting actions on the dashboard so if it, if there's an operator who wants to probably uh, notify somebody uh, manually not not automatically or or probably raise a service now incident or or a remedy incident so so what are the options that we have in terms of that so for integration with system, uh, service management tools, um, from, from uh, specifically from a dashboard, or yes, for, uh, uh, I mean maybe a right-click tool or or a direct-click button on on the dashboard. Okay, so obviously first of all you've got a health rule. There's a lot of actions you can associate with that health rule and say, if this health rule deviates, I want you to create a ticket in my ticketing system. The question there is. Is there a way that we can create a button that you can click to do that manually? Yeah, I mean, I mean, some cases uh, uh, there might not be automated action required, but use a model do some analysis and then click that button. So. Okay, great question. So the closest I've come to that was uh, with uh, with one customer where we created links, which actually had um, mobile numbers built in. Yeah. So it was an iPhone dashboard, and they wanted to know. You know, there's three people you call if this number go if this circle goes red, you call one of these three numbers, and they wanted to put those three numbers on there. So what we did at that point was created a label with a drill down, and the drill down URL was a mobile phone number. If you then view that on your iPhone, because it's a URL and it's got a number in it, you can actually call directly from the dashboard. So I would go down a similar route in that we can create a drill down which will you know, make a, a rest call that creates you a ticket or, or something like that. Yeah, thank you. So many questions. I obviously didn't talk about enough in my presentation. Hi. Um, just a, a, a quick one. So on a, um, a standard chart where you say you, you, know, you can put your baseline on, um, if you do have a, a specific sort of level that you want to be aware of, um, such as a high water mark or a, a, you know, if your load gets to this sort of level, is there a way of putting that sort of top end level on so you can again see the context of your load rising and if it hits that mm -hmm. limit, you know that you need to spin up a few more boxes or yep. you know whatever. Good question. So how do we how do we add watermarks into graphs? First of all, with analytics-powered graphs, there is the possibility to set your axes. If you're going for the kind of the APM dashboard widgets, you're right. There isn't a box in there that you can tick that says "Show me between 0 and 100," for instance, on CPU utilization. If you wanted to do that, one way we've done that with a customer in the past is by making a metric that always equals 100 and adding that on as a metric value make it always equal whatever the, your high watermark. So you know, by having a metric, and you can use a metric expression in there that just says, you know, take, take a metric which is always one and multiply it by 100 or whatever you need to do. But you can create a metric that just creates a straight line across the top, which is then this is my high watermark. And again, you'll see 
for instance, CPU utilization in percentage, you might want to have that on a graph and see whether it's reaching the top of the line or not. So that's the way I would do that, is by adding another metric to the graph that always equals your high watermark. Thank you. Uh, I've been involved in making quite a few dashboards for my organization. Okay. And, uh, in particular, with absolute layout dashboards. Yeah. Uh, and mind you, we're on an older version of the controller. We're not on 4.3. Um, if I move too many things at the same time, or if I move them too quickly, I see an error at the top saying another user is editing this, this widget, almost as if every action I do is committing to a database or saving to your controller somewhere. Uh, and if I do that too quickly or, or in, in quick succession, then it just fails, and I have to reload it, and then it'll be several steps back uh, with where I had things a while ago, maybe 20 minutes ago, and it's very frustrating. So I'm wondering, is that, is that <coughs> something that's looked... It's it's definitely something I've seen before as well, where it says another user has updated this. Um, it's interesting to hear your theory on when you're getting that. I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about that. I think, you know, for that particular issue, what we should be doing is creating a support case, and, and we can chase through that after the, after the after this presentation okay. as well. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I've seen it before. I mean, again, one of the other things that's coming in 4.3, which will help that, is in 4.2 and, and previous versions, dashboards have always auto-saved. And I think it's part of the auto-saving that's the problem. What you can do in 4.3 is turn off the auto-save feature. And all, what it does is it gives you a save icon. So you can make all your changes and then hit save. So there's, there's two things. Num number one, 4.3 is going to help, I think, by having the disable autosave. And number two is when you start making these really good dashboards, it's really good practice to create a dashboard and then save it and then put a version two, a version three, so you can actually have multiple versions of it and then go back and delete your, your unused ones. You know, having the ability to undo negates that a little bit, but I still like to make sure I've got, you know, a couple of different versions of my dashboard as I'm making them. And again, then you can use your role-based access control to make sure people can only see the, the latest version. Make sense? Unless you've snuck it into 4.3, I think you can only uh, create a dashboard via the APIs, and that's really annoying. Can you make it so you can update dashboards as well? Yes, we'll do that for you. <laughs> I will uh, I will definitely make that recommendation to our product team. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's in 4.3, no. But I'll, uh, I'll, I'll raise that with them. Any more? One more? Should we catch up afterwards? Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Mr. Jackson.